Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, oh, okay. Thank you for joining us once again for lesson four of the world of Kabbalah. Um, before we start, I'd like to, uh, so first, uh, so next week we will be having our fifth class. Um, and then the following week, is the week of Hanukkah. So we will not have on that Monday evening, but we'll have the last class the following Monday after uh, Hanukkah. That's going to be um, the 18, 11th. We're not going to have, and we're going to have the 18th. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, now, with regards to Hanukkah, I just want to highlight a few of the different events that everyone uh, ever, uh, that we're going to be having and encourage everyone to join. Uh, well, first of all, this coming Sunday, there will be a kids' event, a kids' uh, Legoland, uh, Menorah Legoland. So if you are into Lego, you're welcome to join. But that's going to be for children. That's going to be this Sunday. But Thursday, in a week from Thursday, we will be having the first night of Hanukkah. Uh, that will be uh, the first night of Hanukkah. That is going, we're going to have a, the grand dreidel, uh, largest dreidel uh, unveiling. Well, the builder actually ends up doing it and getting it done. But that's going to be December 7th. At four uh, at five thirty p.m. and then the f that's going to be five thirty, and then the Sunday that's going to be here, and then Sunday the tenth we are going to be having our annual big menorah lighting this year. Uh, we will be having a ice menorah, a carving of a five foot ice menorah. We'll be lighting that menorah, and that's going to be done at the park at Tamar Recreation Center. Why are you looking at me that way? You didn't check with me first. <laughs> okay, and that's goes, oh, change the plans. <laughs> so that's going to be, that is going to be Sunday, December 10th at 4.30 p.m. And that's going to be, again, down the block in University, Tamarack Recreation Center. And then Tuesday, though, we will have a, be having a menorah lighting and kosher food tasting at Publix, uh, the corner of Pine Island and Southgate. That's going to be at 6.30 p.m. Uh, general Hanukkah is a time of light. Hanukkah is a time of, uh, you know, despite the times we are in, and I would say not not despite, but because of the times we are in, it is really a time to uh, increase in the light, in the light of Hanukkah, and encourage everyone here. Um, hopefully everyone here has their own menorah and is planning on lighting. If you don't, please let me know. Uh, but if you do, and you may know someone, another Jewish neighbor, coworker, friend, family member, who may not have a menorah, or they don't plan on lighting menorah this year to encourage them, especially when it comes to this year, uh, it is all the more necessary. Um, like we've done in the past couple of weeks, I'd like to start off today's class with a chapter of Tehillim. Um, so, um, although right now there is the ceasefire, but still many of our brothers and sisters are in danger in the land of Israel, so we will pray for their protection. Um, you can find it on the board if it's a little bit hard. Uh, to, it's probably going to be a little hard to see it, but I will say it out loud. Shira Malos Ladavid. Samachti Baomrimli Base Adonai Nailah. I am thy sire Aglenu Bashirai Hir Shalayim. Yer Shalayim Habnuya, Kiir Shahurbala Yachta. Shesham Alu Shvatim. Shift the Yah Edis the Sol, Hides Lashem Adinai. Yesham Yashu Kisses, a kisses, Lamishbat Kisses Lay Savid. Shalu Shlaim Yerushalayim. Yeshlaw Avayah. Yesham Mechelech, Shava Barman Asayah. Laman Acharei Adabar No Shalom Bach, Laman Beis Adonai Elheinu Avaksha Toiv Lach. Song of Ascent of David, I rejoice when they sent to me. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet were standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. The built up Jerusalem was like a city that was joined together within itself. There was ascended the tribes, the tribes of God, testimony to Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there, 
were set thrones, uh, thrones for judgment, thrones for the house of David. Request the welfare of Jerusalem. May those who love you enjoy tranquility. May there be peace in your uh, in your wall, tranquility in your places. For the sake, my brethren and my companions, I shall now speak a, a, a peace in you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I shall beg for goodness for you. So I just want to do, you know, sometimes you uh, sometimes you want to do an update. So last week we had a prayer. Uh, we we did uh, we did it we did the class in for the merit of Daphna and Ella Alakam with their mother uh, for who were hostages at that time. And the update of that, this is a picture that was going around. Uh, this was yesterday. Uh, again, we prayed for them last week. And this uh, as of yesterday, they were reunited with their mother. So um, again, whatever whatever a person's own personal opinion about this uh, ceasefire and this you know prisoner or hostage exchange and pray with the prisoners, what we all agree to is the joy of this fam these families that are getting back their loved ones. Um, and may all the hostages return to their families in a safe way. Um, today's uh, today, I'd like to dedicate uh, today's class to a hero, a hero of the Jewish people. His name was Elchanan. It was actually called, uh, they, they've become to known as Sevet Elchanan. And this was a few brothers, a few brothers who on the day of the massacre, the day of the massacre of October 7th, they got into Jeep. There were three of them. There was Elchanan, there was Menachem, and there was David. And they go... They have a they have a you know a, you know a big jeep and they start going and they start they hear what's happening and they go to one of the affected kibbutzim and there they go from the, under fire they go from door to door saying Shema Yisrael saying that this is uh we we are Jews we're here to save you and they go again and again and they, it says that you could see it it's on the news they saved close to hundred people wow. rescuing close to hundred people and by the last house the last house they went to knocked on the door. Um, there was a there was a terrorist there who ambushed them and killed this one of the brothers El Hanan, uh, obviously a hero amongst the Jewish people. And so, um, you know, the, to see to see the funeral is is heartbreaking, but also beautiful because you have so many people who are there who are who are saying, you know, my life is here. I'm here today because of this person. And such a person, you know, says anyone who saves one life is like uh, saved the full world. This is someone together with his brothers who are still alive, uh, who saved many many worlds. So may his neshama have aliyah. And may our, may our learning be a merit for him and for his loved ones. Okay, so today's class is called, lesson four is called The World of Chaos. Now, an hour ago, I just came back from the, from the, from the urgent care with my son who fell and had a, got stitches, uh, had uh, stitches, my son Shell. Um, so it's been a bit of a chaotic afternoon. So I feel very well equipped to give a class called the world of chaos. <laughs> um, but, you know, I one time, I, I one time heard a comedian, I'm forgetting the comedian's name, but he had a large family. He had a part family of four. So he said, what's the definition of having a family of four is imagine you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. <laughs> so today, today's class, we will have a bit, a little bit, be a little bit more complex a little bit more abstract area in Kabbalah, but we will also be touching on a very practical idea, a very practical area, um, which we are all aware of. We're all aware of the concept, um, but today we'll be giving a cab the Kabbalistic term for it, the Kabbalistic uh, underpinnings to this idea. Now, I'm sure everyone here has heard Tikkun Olam. Now, what does Tikkun Olam mean? If I were to ask you, what does Tikkun Olam mean? doing a mitzvah, doing a good thing. But what, what do those words mean? Tikkun olam literally means fixing this world. Fixing, tikkun means to fix. Olam means the world. But what does that mean? Is that just an expression? Where does that phrase come from? So after today's class, which we are going again, we're going to be going deep, um, very abstract. Uh, but we will also get a better idea of what this tikkun olam means and the power of this idea, the depth of this idea. So let's take a, let's take a recap. A recap, a small recap of this, uh, of what we've been learning until today and where we are holding. So we started off in the first class uh, where we spoke about the idea that God had to create an a other. Before the, before the creation, everything was, there was nothing independent of God. So then we had the three worlds of Bria, Yetzir, Asiya, or the acronym of Bia. And this represents the first level of that which is independent of God. That which is, there's a other besides for God. Of a world which feels a, a, a certain feeling of independence. And each, each world 
is a lower level. You know, Bria is still, although it feels uh, uh, there is some small feeling of independence, but it's still very, very connected. The lower you get, the more independent to God, the feeling of independence of God. Until you get to this world, we can walk around this world and not feel God at all. Now, in our world, as we're as we're focusing everything, there's a mirror both between the you know the divine and our world. In our world, this is our anyone remembers our thoughts, speech, and action, our expressions, which is not who we are. This is the way we express ourselves to others, and this we could change. We could because that is not who it's not connected to us. This is our this is something which is a lot easier to change. And that's why we have control. Ultimately, we are what is demanded from us to control our thoughts, speech, and action. Which um, last week, uh, sorry, two weeks ago, lesson two, we spoke about the Sephiroth moving up the chain. In the, we have the highest world, which is the world of emanation. And over there, we have the, uh, the, the beginning of godliness, how it's defined. Before that, God is not defined at all. Then we have the 10 Sephiroth. Over here, we have the different levels of Chesed, Gevura. We have kindness and severity. Over here, we have, it's, already, it's still a part of God, but it's how God, which was undefined, comes into a definition. And this is mirrored in our own lives. How and this is the this is our uh, you know our mitos, you know, our, our intellect, our characteristics. We focus on a few of them, but we have the chesed, we have the part of us which is kind, we have the part of us which is exacting, which is more of a judgment. And the way we know what is our mission in uh, in, in this world is by knowing what is our characteristics, what is uh what is something we by nature lean for uh, lean towards that tells us where we are rooted in the ten sefirot. And last week we spoke about the Ain Sof, the infinity, the infinity of God, the uh, the infinite light, which this is what is the this is what's called the Keter. Uh, over here is where everything is one. There is no definition at this point. And this is in our world. This is the rut zone. This is our desire, our strongest passions. And desires is what is infinite by us. And that's why when we do something, we do, you know, you could, we can live a life and we can live a life without, without, uh, without passion. But what you're lacking over there is you're not tapping into that highest level of yourself. Doing something with passion is not just a cherry on top. It actually changes the way you do something and it changes the drive and changes how much you're able to get done. Because if a person has truly a rutzel towards something, a desire towards something, then we are able to. Then we are able to um, then we are able to really uh, succeed in a way way above our imagination because again that is connected to the infinite of God. Now, so far, we've been speaking about the side of us. It's all good. It's all perfect. But we know that this is not so simple because what about the negative? In our in in myself, everyone has negativity inside themselves, toxicity inside themselves, and in the world around. Where does that come from? Again, so far, all we've been speaking about is what seems to be the goodness in ourselves, in you know how it's mirrored than divine. But where does that come into the world? So now some people, some religions have said that there's two systems in this world. You know, there is the system of God, and then there is the system of the devil, you know, the, the Satan. But Judaism rejects this. It's very important to recognize that Judaism very clearly rejects this approach because we believe everything that comes in this world comes from Hashem. There's nothing that is, and there's nothing that has an independent power of God. That's a form of idolatry. So then, where does evil come from? Where is we again? We're saying everything that's in our lives in this world is a mirror to God. Where is the source of evil and negativity? In this world, where does that, where is the source for that? Which leads us to the today's discussion, which is what is called the world of chaos. Or in the Kabbalistic term, you may have heard this before, it's called the world of Tohu. The world of Tohu and the world of Tikkun. And what these, and we're, uh, what these represent and where do we find them in our own lives. So in order to get into this, we will start with a exercise. Okay, everyone, 20 push-ups. No. Uh, exercise 4.1 on page 111, page 111 in your book. And we are going to, uh, I want to read these. And as objectively as possible, respond to each of the following self-reflective statements. Consider each question on its merits without regard for consistency with the other responses. Okay, so question number one, all of my yes or no. I am a, I am a selfish person. 
Question two, I am not a selfish person. Question, question three, at times I really only care about myself and my well-being. Some things are more significant than my existence. I would never knowingly do something to hurt another person. I know that I've hurt others in pursuit of my goals. I sometimes feel glad when someone else fail, fails. I do not want to rejoice over someone else's troubles. When I want something, I find it very difficult to resist it, even when I recognize that it is harmful to my moral and spiritual well-being. I weigh short-term gains against the long-term long -term harm they may invite. So you may have figured out all these are kind of contrasting each other, the opposite of each other. Now, I'm not going to ask everyone for their answers, but if you're like me, we, I can speak for myself, that it's very hard to answer any of these questions in, in absolute terms. And many times you may find yourself answering yes to two things which are contradictory. <laughs> Maybe. Now, what, what, so how do we answer this? How do we answer this contradiction? Where, again, sometimes, could we call ourselves a selfish person? Like, hopeful, you know, Hopefully, maybe, hopefully, no, but can we say we're not selfish? So, so what's the answer? And the answer is, as human beings, we are complicated. We are complex people. And, and, and therefore, not always, you know, we will have different parts to ourselves. Now, so how do we, how do we understand this? How do we understand the fact that we are complicated? Am I, who am I? Am I the person who is a good person who wants to give charity, or I mean, the person who sometimes, for you know, will push away someone else for my own gratification. Who, who, you know, who's the real me? You know, they say that they say the they say the story of a salesman who is going to 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 knock uh, knocking on doors, and he comes to the door and he hears a whole ruckus inside, but he knocks on the door and he doesn't want to like, get involved. So he someone answers. So he says, you know, I, I'd like to speak to the to the person in charge of this house. He said, you came perfect time. We're figuring that out right now. You know? So who is the real me? Who is the real person in charge? Is it the good person? Inside? Is, it the, is it the moral person, the virtuous person? We all have. Or is it the person who struggles, struggles with their impulses, struggles with doing the right thing, and sometimes fails at doing the right thing? You know, are we, are we Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde? Who, are, who, is the, who, is the real, who is the real me? And this is something which humans have always struggled with. You know, we are complex, uh, we are complex creatures. We are altruistic, we are spiritual, we are connected to God, but we also have selfish drives and hedonistic uh, instincts. So who is who is the real us? So now you may you may have seen, you know, there there's the cartoons out there, which you have a you have a person, and on one side you have you know the good voice, the, uh, the angelic voice, and then you have on the other side, you have the voice of the devil. But that is, while that may actually seem close to the Jewish approach to it, the Kabbalistic approach, but the truth is it's very different as we will as we will learn in the next uh, in, in the next little bit. And that is Kabbalah tells us, you may have heard this before, especially those that have uh, you may perhaps learned some Tanya before. I've spoken about this many times before. but Kabbalah takes what is called the two soul doctrine that every single person has two souls within them. What does this mean that we have two souls within them? So let's take a first, let's uh, start this off by text number one, page 112. The first of our souls originate in unholiness. This soul resides in our bloodstream to vitalize our body. It is the source of all our negative character traits, as well as those positive traits that come naturally to us, such as compassion and kindness. A Jew's second soul is an actual part of the transcendent God. So we have, we don't have, it's not that we have we're one, we have one soul with different influences. No, we have two different souls within us. And here's the next point, which is very important. These two souls are not good and bad, good and evil. Rather, they are good and animalistic. Or in the Hebrew terms, they are it's called the nefesh elokis, which is the godly soul. And the nefesh of Bahamas. And I just truth I said good and animalistic, godly and animalistic. That would be the proper description of it. And then you have the nefesh of Bahamas, the animalistic, uh, animalistic soul. Now, what is the animalistic soul? Why and why do we call it animalistic? It's not, we, we don't have an animal inside of us. And our soul is very different than, uh, you know, so, uh, animals also have souls. 
So what is it? Why are we calling it animalistic soul? This soul, and this is the first soul we have. This is self-serving. This is about ourselves. You know, let's take a look at animals. Animals are loving, many animals are loving creatures. Many of us here have pets, and many of us, many over here, we love our pets, but that does not take away the fact that animals are instinctual animals, that they're there for themselves. Ultimately, they care. Ultimately, even when they do do acts of kindness, and when they do act in a loving way, it's because it makes them feel good. And that's not a bad thing. That's how God created it. So too, we have a soul within us, which is animalistic. And again, animalistic doesn't mean bad. Animalistic can also be good, but it's about it's about for it's about myself. You know, a person can live a very good life, be a very good person under the influence of the animalistic soul. How is this? Because a person lives their whole life, and it's all about what makes me feel good. It's all about. And again, a person can do charity. A person can be a kind person. But it's not about being altruistic. It's about, it makes me feel good to be a good person. That is living under the influence of that soul. You know, sometimes I call it the human soul. Animalistic has a certain, when you call it animalistic soul, people have a certain negative connotation to it. This is not a bad soul. This, this soul can lead to evil, can lead to negativity. But in its root, it's not a bad soul. This is what a person is born with. A person. You know, you take a child. A child that's born is completely self-serving. You know, a one-day child, a one-month child, my emotion does not think of anyone but himself. And that's not bad. That's just how God created him. When you are born, you are completely self-serving about my needs, about its uh, their ability to eat, their ability to sleep. And the godly soul, what is the godly soul? The godly soul is... Not about me, not about what I am needed, and not about, you know, but what, what am I needed for? About being altruistic, going beyond myself, looking at someone else to do something good for someone else, not because it's going to make me feel good, but because that's what I'm needed at this moment to do. As a person, as a child matures a little bit, their godly soul becomes a little bit more pronounced. You know, this is why we say bar mitzvah, bar bat mitzvah is 13 or 12 years old. Why is that? Why do we consider at that point them to have, that is the time when they have their godly soul? Because that's the age where we feel they have the maturity level to be able to think beyond themselves. You know, and you see this, as a child gets older, the older child gets, you hope, you know, part of the maturation process, the maturing is, you know, a two-year-old, you're not going to expect to be altruistic. Even a four-year-old, you want them to do something, generally, you have to give them something. Give them a prize. But hopefully when, as they're six, seven, eight years old, they're maturing a little bit. And at that point, you're expecting them to be able to recognize, I'm not just doing this because it make, how it makes me feel. Maybe this is the right thing to do. So this is what we speak about. When we speak about the, we have two souls. We have two operating systems within us. You know, they have, a, there's a story. There's a story of the Alt Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe. Very, uh, um, and he, uh, there was a chassid. There was one of his followers who came to him, and this was a this was a this was a good person. You know, this is a person, a high stature person, a learned person. And he comes to the to the rebbe, and he keeps on asking, he, he keeps on saying, you know, why is God not doing this for me? I need this in my life. I need this in my life. And at a certain point, the altar stops him and says, "I keep on hearing what you need from God, but I'm not hearing you ask." What's needed from you? What God needs from you? And he said that the chassid fainted. The chassid fainted because he understood the message. Till, till that point, while he was a good person, it was everything was self-serving. You know, 150, year, uh, 150 years later, by the inauguration of JFK, John F. Kennedy, he said something very similar. Ask not what? Complete the sentence. <laughs> it, that's exactly the point. That was saying the same idea. Don't have the, don't think of this country as self-serving, what it could do for me. Sometimes ask yourself, what am I needed for? This is the difference between the animal soul and the godly soul. Now, and now, and this is, you know, even if you walk out today with this idea, the two-soul doctrine, that we have that within us, and that answers 
are the question of the exercise. How could it be that and sometimes I'm selfish? The answer could be, am I selfish? Yes. Am I not selfish? Maybe also yes. Because we're two people. We inside of us, we have two souls which are pulling at us. You know, imagine having a car that sometimes it has to, it can either run exclusively on gas or exclusively on, uh, on electric. I, I think such cars exist today. So that's who we are. We have two operating systems. Now, sometimes I may be gu guided by the godly soul. And that's when I am, you know, that's when I'm altruistic. That's when I do what's needed. And then sometimes at other times, you know, at other times I'm being pulled in the other direction. And that's what makes us complicated because we have that dual system in the, that dual system within us. So this is, this is, um, let's take a look at, let's take a look at key term, 4.1, page 112. Or you could also take a, the, the nefesh of Hamas, the, which literally is translated as the animal soul, the human soul that is self-oriented and can trigger immoral behavior. Take a look at the screen. The nature of the nefesh of Hamas. It is uniquely human. Again, only we have such a soul. Only we have, this is the human soul. This is what, this, a person when they're born, the first thing is they have a drive to live a drive, which again, a certain self-centeredness, a drive for themselves, again, which is not bad at that point. This is survival for physical needs. Again, just like an animal. Animals live on instinct of survival. You know, we have pets, but let's go, let's talk about in the wild. In the wild, you go to you go into the wild, you see a an, you see a you see a lion. I don't know if you ever went on a, ever went to a safari, you see a lion, you know, going and ripping up impala and eating it for dinner. Does that make the lion a bad animal? It's not a bad animal. It's survival. It's instinct. That's what, you know, that's dinner for it. That it, it needs to live because that's animalistic is about itself. Now, when it comes to human beings, if we would rip up something and eat it, you know, that, that, that there would be negativity there. Why? Because we have the choice to ch how we want to choose. But for an animal, that's, con that's considered completely normal because it is, it is as survival. The nature of the nefesh also is gratification. What makes me feel good at the moment? And it also has positive traits of self-orientation. Again, this is not just, uh, many people make the mistake. Many people think when we speak about the animalistic soul, we're talking about something which is inherently bad. That is incorrect. A person can do much good while they're thinking about themselves. Think about all the people who they're doing a lot for the world, but it's all about what people will say about themselves, the honor they're going to get. I'm not saying they shouldn't do it. If that's what it takes, let them do the good, but recognize that it's being driven by the animal soul because again, it's about myself. And finally, it can also, if it's left unchecked, it can lead to immoral behavior. Again, this is not, it does not, it's, it's not in its pure state like this, but when left unchecked, if you're all about yourself, then that can lead ultimately to negativity and toxicity and to evil. Now, what do we have? What is the what is the godly soul? The godly soul is the exact opposite of the animalistic soul. Key term 4.2, page 113. Nefesh, the godly soul, the human soul that yearns for a closer relationship with, with God and to fulfill its mission. Again, the nefesh, kit desires a relationship with God, back to the board, a relationship with other souls. Again, we're looking to connect in an authentic way, not just what, you know, we speak about relationships. And I spoke about this the past couple of weeks. So sometimes in a relationship, it's self-serving. You know, why do I like you? Why do I love this person? Because what they do for me. That is a relationship, which is an animalistic relationship because it's all about me, what you're going to do for me. A true relationship, a godly relationship is not about what you're going to do for me. It's about us connecting and what I could do for you. It's about a certain altruism. And that's a real, that's a real relationship um, to fulfill its God's given mission and to focus on what it's needed for. So here we have the two different, uh, the two different souls, the animalistic soul, the godly soul. Again, for some of you, this you may be familiar with these terms. For some of you, this may be a new idea, but again, this is so important. We go through our life recognizing we have both of these systems within us. Now, here's the question. Which is stronger? What is stronger, the animal soul or the godly soul? Who wants to take a guess? Animal soul. Okay, very good. <laughs> what do you mean most? So Kabbalah says 
the animal soul is the stronger soul. Let's, uh, well, well, we'll see. Uh, by the end of the class, we'll understand Kabbalistically why it's the stronger soul. It's not just because, but we'll see there's a reason for that. Let's take a look at text number two. This comes, okay, this comes from Rabbi Yossi to Sherison. The ox strengths produces abundant crops. That is to say, the animal soul drive is more potent than the godly soul's drive. Well, here we have, again, in a literal form, it's talking about the ox, you know, is able to produce a lot, but we're talking about, on a deeper level, the ox referring to the animalistic soul, it is able to produce much more than the godly soul. Now, everyone recognizes this is something which is natural. A person's drive, a person's passion towards what makes them feel good is a lot stronger than the passion when it comes to help someone else out, to be altruistic. You know, my father, my father says this every year. My father lives in Michigan. I'm originally from Michigan. So he always says on the holiday of Sukkot. Holiday of Sukkot in Michigan is, the truth is the same could apply for here in Florida. Uh, over in the other direction, over here it's very hot. But over there, it's starting to get cold and it's very rainy. So people, you know, people have a sukkah, are constantly kind of, you know, do I have to sit in the sukkah? It's raining today. It's a little bit cold today. Now, Sukkot is also the start of college football season. So my father always speaks about how, you know, MSU or U of M, over there you have a stadium. And you have 100,000 uh, uh, fans packing into the stadium in the cold weather, the rainy weather, and they're excited. No one's thinking of not going there. Why is this? Now come to the sukkah. Should I be in the sukkah? Is it too cold to be in the sukkah? In the stadium, they're taking off their shirt there. Why is this? Because... Our God, our our animal soul has a lot more passion. Yeah, it's a lot easier to be excited and to be sharing when it comes to the football game. And when it comes to being a show, you know, we're half asleep. All this comes from the fact that the godly soul is not as strong, does not have that same passion as the animalistic soul. So now, as Alan said, maybe this is a little bit depressing. Maybe this is uh, you know, why is it like this? So we're gonna see there is a deep reason for this, and there's a powerful idea, but that. In order to get that, we will have to um, get to the end of the lesson. So what is stronger? The animal soul is significantly more robust than the godly soul. So, <laughs> so there's, a, there's a very cute story, uh, but it has a lot of depth, this story. There's a very story of uh, 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 a big chassid. His name was Shmuel Munkus. He was a person of great stature, and he was a... He was, uh, you know, people looked up to him, but he was also a very humorous person. And he was known as, uh, you know, a little bit of a comedian. While he was very learned and very Kabbalistic, uh, he lived in the 17th century. Uh, and he would always bring out different ideas in a humorous way. Where, where he did different lessons and uh, different lessons in godliness. And people always looked at So they say one time, there was a gathering. There was a gathering of people. And the gathering of, again, of, of more, you know, if you want to call it the elites. The elites of, in, the, in the Hasidic community. And they were gathering there. And whatever, I'm not sure what, why the gathering was. But he said, uh, suddenly, the chef comes out with a, a, pot, uh, with a, with a tray of piping tongue, which was a very big delicacy base, especially back then. And everyone's, you know, kind of ooing and eyeing at, the, at, this, at, this, at this platter of tongue. Shmuel sees it. He runs over to it and grabs it. And he starts, he starts dancing with it. Everyone's kind of looking a little bit strangely, but this is this is Shmuel Munkus, you know, the jokester. And but suddenly they're like, they're kind of getting impatient. New, you know, give it to us already. And what does he do? He takes it and he throws the whole thing into the dirty garbage. And now they're upset. You no, know, a waste of food. You know, this is this, we're all waiting for this. Two minutes later, it comes by and the chef comes running out. Don't eat the, don't eat the tongue. Don't eat it. It's not kosher. Okay. Now, now everyone's, you know, everyone's all happy. These are people who never touched something not kosher in their life. But now they turn to Shmuel, like, how did you know this? You know, we thought, you know, we uh, maybe we should have a higher level of respect for you. So Shmuel says, no, 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 I, I did, I'm not a prophet. But when this came out, I felt this burning desire, this passion for this. And then I looked around and I saw everyone had the same feeling. And I felt if this is something, you know, we're talking about people with, you know, a higher level. And I saw this, I figured this can't be something which is good. This must be coming from the animal soul. And I figured, again, I didn't know why, I didn't know what, I didn't know where. But if there was this, such a strong passion to it, there must be something unkosher about this. So this is a cute story, but it tells us sometimes, you know, how do we know? Sometimes if we have such a strong desire, passion for something, maybe we have to look at it a second time. Because a lot of times, when we have that strong passion to something, many times it's not coming from the good side. 
because generally it's our animal soul which has a, a greater passion than the godly soul. So now the whole chart that we explained until this week. So let's speak about let's speak about the chart. You can also look at inside your chart over here. Um, again, class one, two, three: the blue zone, the green zone, and the yellow zone. All of these we have. All of these we have twice within us. Again, there is the godly soul and there is the animal soul. That that is so we have, and that's why if you take a look at the at the sephirot, the ten sephirot, you know you have them color coded. You have the top is gray, the bottom is you know reddish. What is the idea of there? Because they exist twice within us. We have two powers of chesed. We have two powers of kindness. We have the godly power of kindness when we do something kind for the altruistic reason. And then we have kindness, how it's done for myself. I feel good about being kind to this person. Now, and if that's left unchecked, kindness could also lead to evil. If a person is kind to someone who is, you know, you're kind to the wrong person. You know, we're speaking about the fight against good and evil, you know, uh, between light and terror. Sometimes kindness, what could be disguised as kindness, can itself be immoral, itself be evil. So everything we have, all these, everything we've learned until today, we have it twice within us, in the godly side, and we have it in the in the uh, and then we have it in the animalistic side. Now, which is in control? Who is uh, who is who is uh, who is in control of ourselves? Who is that? You know, as I said before, who is the head of the house? And they say uh, Woody Allen once said, "You know, I'm in charge of the house." So they said, so, they said, so what about your wife? Says, "Ah, she just makes the, the decisions." So who is who's the one who's who's the one in charge? Who's the one who we allow to be in charge? Is it the god that which is godly or that which is animalistic? Now, this all brings us back to the question. We speak about two souls, but where does what is the source of this animalistic soul? Again, the past three weeks we've been talking about how everything we have within us is a mirror to the divine. Does God have an animalistic part to us? Does God have, is there a part of God which can lead to immoral behavior, which is anger, jealousy, which is self-centered. Okay, where does this exist this from us? The past couple of weeks we've been saying, you know, whether it came to the Sephirot and uh, the, the Ratzo, all of it is source of the divine, is the mirror to the divine. But if we're understanding it, we have, we don't just have our godly soul, we also have the animalistic soul. Where does this come from? Which brings us to the topic of today, and that is... Uh, the human soul yearns with desire, contains ten attributes, and possesses three garments. These apply to each person twice, again, both in the godly and in the animalistic. Okay, but but if we if we're to understand it properly, we understand that that's when we speak about jealousy, we don't mean it in a negative way. Sometimes sometimes jealousy can be done again when it's in a godly way, it can be done the proper way. Again, not not for today's conversation, but are we to understand that in a just uh in just a evil way? You know, how, how could we understand that? So if a human reflects Seder Eshtalshalos, why do we have two souls? In other words, where, where is the second soul in God? How can the animal soul be an opponent? Where does it come from? And how is it stronger than the godly soul? All these things we have to figure out. We and Again, this all comes back to the basic premise, the basic question. Where does our negativity come from? Nothing is, nothing is independent of God. And everything has a source in godliness. So where does this come from? Which brings us to the topic of today's conversation, which is what is called the Oros and the Kalim and the Shavirata Kalim, or otherwise known as Tohu and Tikkun, which literally means the lights and the vessels and the breaking of the vessels. So in my home, we deal with the breaking of the vessels daily. But uh, but what does it mean when we speak about the breaking of the vessels. When we talk about the light and the vessels, what does this mean? What is that? What is the idea over here? So again, I, I started off this. Uh, I started off, and now is really where it comes into focus. What I said before, what we are going to discuss right now is from the deepest and the most abstract parts of Kabbalah. You know, there is, uh, and this is something which, for me to say, I understand this completely. You know, I'd be a fool to say that because some of the greatest minds have toiled years and years. 10, 20, 30 years, some of the biggest Kabbalists in this area. So there is a very deep part of this, but I'd like to hopefully focus 
and a more basic idea within this, which we can have, there's a, there's a basic message and a basic takeaway, how it relates to us. So again, some of the ideas, so in the next 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, if there's an idea, which again, seems a little bit abstract to you, you feel like maybe getting a little bit lost, again, recognize that it is a very deep area, but hopefully we'll tie it up a little bit at the end and make it all, you know, make partial sense, if you want to say, make a, have a, have a takeaway to this idea. And every Sephira, we spoke about the 10 Sephiroth. In every Sephira, there is what is called the R and the Kali. Literally, trans, uh, 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 literally tra uh, translated as the light and the vessel. Yeah, the Sephiroth, there are two parts of each Sephira. There is the light. Again, you see the top of it, that's the light. And the bottom, that is the Kali. That is the the vessel. What does this mean? Let's say let's first see this inside. See that I'm you know I'm, I'm not making this up. Let's find the source for this in the Zohar. Text number text number three. This comes from the Zohar. The king is present within the ten attributes of Atzilut. He and his vessels are one in that world, and he and his lights are one in that world. So we speak about the lights, and we speak about the vessel. What does this mean? What does it mean when we speak about light and vessel? So I want to explain to you that in every area of your life, there is the light and there is the vessel. In every, again, we're, every single area, if you, you know, strip it down, you really take a look at it, you will be able to find the light and the vessel in that area in life. But to get a better idea, JLI made a helpful uh, graph for this. So I want you to take a look at figure 4.1. Hopefully this will give some clarity to this idea. We have lights and vessels, and it's going to give us five examples. But again, this is just examples. Really, every single area in life. Some places, it may not be as obvious. And some places, you have to search a little bit. But in every area, there is the light, there is the vessel. Again, what is the light and what is the vessel? The vessel is what holds, you know, vessel is a cup, holds the water. And the light is the energy, the, you know, the meaning behind it. So let's, let's go, go through the different examples. In a book, the light, the, the, the light, the energy, if you want to, some people call it energy, a light, however you want to call it, is the idea behind the book. The message the author is trying to put that you should understand. What is the vessel? The actual words. You know, the words, the, the, the words. Now, if what would be, what would, what would, what would, you know, having just the vessel, having words that don't make sense. So again, in a book, when you read a book, there is the words, the ABCs, the, the spell out words, and then there is the message behind it. That is the light, and that is the vessel. That carries. carries the meaning. Again, just like a cup holds the water, you have to have words in a book in order to carry the message that the author is trying to impart. Let's speak about a melody, a song. Yeah. Yeah. Again, in a very in a, in a physical sense, you have a vessel, a cup, hat holds the water. In a metaphorical sense, so you have. The, bo the book, the words of the book holds the message that the author is trying to convey. Let's think about it. music, a melody. So what is the light over there? The emotion behind the music. Every single music, every single melody has its own unique, distinct emotion and feeling. You no, know, you have certain, you have certain, certain music, which is haunting, certain music, which is more sad, certain which is more happy, more dancing. That is, that is the light. Then there is, what's the vessel? The notes. What actually makes that into that, it contains that light. In business, you have, what is the light? The vision. What am I trying to create over here? What is my, what is the, what is the mission statement of the business? What is the, what is, the, what is the vessel? It is the strategy, you know, the numbers. How am I going to bring it out into reality? Uh, you know, this one I really like, relationship. In relationship, you have, what is the light? The love. The, key, the the passion towards one another. What is the what is the vessel for that? The action. But it, if you don't have, you know, w w w let's speak about an anniversary. So anniversary. So someone's celebrating an anniversary. So you have a person buys a a person on an anniversary. The spouse will buy you know their spouse a anniversary card. Over there, what do you have? What is the what is the, the anniversary card? Is the vessel. What's the light behind that? The love. If you have, if you don't have the love, if you don't have the light there, then the vessel is meaningless. If you're just giving a car without any of the feelings behind it, 
then there's no meaning to the car. So again, you have the, but again, and if a person just has the light without the vessel, is that ever going to express their love in any action? They're also missing. So again, you have the vessel, you have the light and you have the vessel. And finally, in religion, in religion, you have, in religion, you have a, uh, in religion, you have, what is the light? What is the energy? The belief system. What, you know, what, what I'm believing in. And what is the vessel? The ritual, the mitzvah, the, the actual actions I'm doing in order to express my belief. Again, here's five examples. But in each of them, but when, when, when you understand properly the idea of lights and vessels, we can now understand how every single thing in this world, every interaction, there is the light over there and there is the vessel. Now, and sometimes, you know, sometimes people get focused on the vessel and they don't have the light. Again, let me go back to the, the example of relationships. You know, many times people are focused on the exact, you know, the gift and what type of gift and what, and sometimes what the other person wants is really more the light, is really more, you know, is really more just the, the expression of love, the expression of the words that they're using to feel the to feel the light and not so much the vessel. I remember hearing a story from Rabbi Lipsker, Rabbi Lipsker from Bell Harbor, uh, the pretty famous rabbi, of uh, one of the oldest Chabad rabbis uh, in Florida. And he says he remembers that there was one time a fabulously wealthy person who came to him, who came to him and he said, and he came to him and said, um, you know, I have a, I have a son. He had a son, he, 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 he got divorced and he had a son who lived by him and he was a very close relationship with his son. But at a certain point, he got remarried and there was a lot of tension between his new wife and the, between the, his wife and the wife's, you know, uh, stepson. His, his son, and they clashed. And at a certain point, his his wife now uh, uh, his wife told told uh, told her husband, "It's either me or your child." That was that was the ultimatum. And the father, who again was a fabulously wealthy person, goes to his son. The son's a teenager at this point, and says, "You know, I'm willing to buy you a house. I'm going to buy you a house. I'm going to buy you a you know a car, and I'm going to all the luxury, but you have to move out." And the son wouldn't hear from it. The son says, yeah, yeah. so the father says, I'm giving you everything. Well, what else do you want? To which the son replied, I want a father. You know, and what, what is the depth of the story? Is that the father was trying to give the son the vessel without the light. The, the you know, the, the, the material, you know, the, the, the car, the, that was all. If you don't have the love there, if you're lacking the love, if you're lacking the care, then the vessel is meaningless. And this is the idea of having a light and having a vessel. They, they say a story of a rabbi who went to give a very long sermon, a very long, he was known for a long sermon. And after he's finished the sermon, so someone comes to him from the back and says, you know, I, I, I work for a television company. And this idea, you said, we'd love to you say on television. Are you able to condense it? Are you able to, you can't say so that long. Are you able to make, make it shorter? So everybody thinks, you know, what an opportunity he has. He says, Okay, yeah, I can do it in half hour. He says, you don't understand. Can you condense it to say this in four minutes? Everybody says, finally, so everybody says, yes. So he replies, so why didn't you? <laughs> you know, and what is the what what is the depth of this story? The depth of this story is that if the if the if the light, if the light could be in four, if, the, 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 if you could say that in four minutes, so why are you making a vessel which is 10 times as long? Why are you saying it in an hour? If you can say the message in four minutes, if the light is four minutes long, why did you create a vessel, which is an hour? In other words, in life, we have to match the, we have to have that healthy balance between the, between the light and the energy and the vessel, which contains it. Now this exists, this idea of, or, and again, in Hebrew, this is called Oros and Caleb. Oros is the light by he, or there was light. Oros is the light. Caleb is the vessel which holds on to this light. Now, just like this exists in our world, where we have, again, everything has the art to it, the light to it, the energy, and the Caleb, the vessel, so do you have this in the divine. Now, what is, what is this in the divine? So when we speak about the Sephirot of Atzil, so you have the energy, the energy of just the pure godly light. That is the energy that is the light. What is the keli? What is the vessel? This is the vessel that allows it to project outwards. That gives it some sort of shape to be able to express it into, you know, into the lower worlds. Again, here we have over here the marriage of the light and the vessel, the container of the messages coming to give. 
Now, uh, another example of this is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say that example later. So now what, the problem with, with this is when we speak about Oros and Kalim, we speak about light and vessels. Many times they are often opposites. Often they, it's hard for them to come together. Let's speak again, go back to relationships. True love is often hard to express. You know, many times you say, I, I can't express my love towards you. What is that? Because the Kaylee, the vessel, when I, when I do something, it's almost minimizing my love towards the person. There often times it's very hard to have this, you know, when it comes to religion, many spiritual people like to be ascetic, like to rip themselves away from this world. Why is this? Because they feel if I really, the R, the light, the energy is too strong for me to bring down into a, into a vessel, to bring down into action. I'd rather be up on a mountain meditating. In other words, focusing on the art, focusing on the energy, the light, because it's hard for it to come together with the vessel. The art, the light pulls inward. It's more internal feeling. It's more, you know, uh, think of an author. The author is someone who, the author of a book is someone who just wants to, you know, write and wants to, you know, keep on thinking and more, or more ideas. And then you have the publisher that, you know, who represents the vessel getting into the book. He says, no, you have to limit it. You have to put in a certain amount of words, a certain amount of paragraphs. Many times they are very, you know, the many times they are disconnected. Let's take a look at text 4a. And again, I recognize what we're speaking about a little bit abstract. Um, text 4a. The light itself it is, is in a state of simple abstractness. The vessel imposes a definition of the light in the form of a particular attributes of wisdom, kindness, and so forth. Again, I, it's a very uh, abstract what it's saying over here. But the light itself wants to kind of come inwards, remain connected to God. Does not want to be expressed. What is the vessel? The vessel is trying to make it into a particular form, giving it into a certain vessel. This is wisdom. This is kindness. You know, this is, has this chapter. This has this chapter. And this is the inherent um, contradiction of the idea of Oros and Kalim, of vessels of, of light and the vessel. Let's, let's, I, I want to show uh, the lesson video, which hopefully it gives a little bit of clarity on this idea. Uh, so just over here we have the infinite, and then you have the channels of raw, finite energy. This is before it comes into any to any form of vessel. This is just the pure light, the pure energy. Into its vessel, into a vessel of chesed, of kindness, of gavura. Okay. Light wants to pull inwards, and the vessels channel outwards. Okay. Welcome to our fourth video on the world of Kabbalah, our journey through the mystical layers of the Kabbalistic system. Today, we'll analyze the Sefirot, which are actually a combination of two elements. The Kabbalists call them Orot, lights, and Kalim, vessels. Spiritual containers or conductors for the divine light now, there's no electromagnetism in the spiritual heavens, so the terms lights and vessels are just metaphors. Light refers to the abstract divine energy behind any particular reality, and vessel refers to the structure applied to that energy to facilitate a specific function. Okay, that's a bit heavy, so let's use Benny as an example. Benny got beaten up at school, and Benny's dad is really disturbed, which, by the way, is a powerful but undefined energy. It is the light or force without any particular vessel or outlet. But dad has several options. He could release it as frustration with the school, anger at the attacker, empathy, love and guidance for Benny, compassion for a bully who needs emotional redirection, and so on. Those are all potential vessels for the same basic light. So the vessels of the Sefirot are 10 unique outlets for the <coughs> same basic energy. They apply structure and definition that turn divine energy into chesed, love, gevura, discipline, teferet, harmony, and so on. 
What if we kept the divine light but deleted its vessels? It would be like Dad feeling deeply disturbed at Benny's experience but having no ability to express or do anything about it. And what if we kept the vessels but deleted the light? It would be like Dad having the ability to react but lacking any motivation. In either case, there would be no reaction, no result. So this example helped us understand I lost your voice. why the Sephirot are equipped with divine vessels. But we've still got a problem. We refer to the divine abstract energy as light because it is constantly connected <coughs> with its source, God himself, just as sunlight is present only when the sun is present. Being intimately connected with God gives it a powerful appreciation for God. It longs to melt into God's infinite self and is utterly averse to being channeled into a limited structure. As for the vessels, they pull the other way. They're so addicted to structure that they have no patience for the abstractness of life. Talk about a personality clash. How can they ever fuse together? Simple. We're discussing the world of Atzilut, which is in tune with God's desire. It knows that the purpose of its existence is to create the finite world of Berea, Yetzira, and Asiya. So out of loyalty for God, the conflicting components of the Sefirot set aside their dispositions and work harmoniously to achieve the greater good of God's goals. That's good news for us for two reasons. One, it allows us to exist. Two, our souls are the great-grandchildren of the Sefirot of Atzilut. So we inherited the ability to set aside our personal dispositions to achieve the greatest good, whether it is to care for another, pursue a mitzvah act, or embrace our ethical responsibility. Well, again, what we have over here, and again, just reiterating, I recognize this is more of an abstract idea, and Kabbalah, this is perhaps the deepest parts of Kabbalah, but we have the Oros and the Kalim, the vessel, the, the, the light, the energy and the vessel. Now light and the, the light and, and the vessels do not want to work together by nature. Their nature is very different. Again, light is more the energy wants to kind of go up to its, uh, up to its, up to its source. You know, the, the, the example that Kabbalah gives for this is fire. Fire is an existence which is constantly looking to go back to its source. If it doesn't have something to pull it down, what will happen will burn itself out. It's looking to go back to its source. That's why our soul is called like a fire. We're looking to go up to God. Now, the vessel, the existence wants to remain down here. So that's what it's saying in text 4, um, 4, 4, 4b. The lights of Atzilut, by their very nature, are abstract. They also aspire to return to their source and to become wholly subsumed with their, their sublime origin. Accordingly, they are far removed from creating the worlds of Briar, Yitzhi, or Asiya. Rather, lights must first install themselves into the vessels of Atzilut in order to energize the creation of the world. Because again, by nature, they don't want to come into this world. They don't want to go into the vessels. What allows them to go into this vessel? So let's go to, and I'm going to skip some of the uh, some of the different texts. Let's, um, what, what, what allows it to have this marriage? They are entirely, for, text 4D, or let's do 4C. Lights and vessels are inherently opposites. The light by their very nature are abstract. They also aspire to return to their source and to become wholly subsumed within their sublime nor uh, origin. By contrast, vessels have a defined nature. They desire to retain their configuration and are naturally inclined to descend to lower realms. So how do they come together? If, you, again, you have naturally their opposites, naturally have different inclinations, how do we bring them together? Or D, they are entirely submitted to God's intent for creation. Namely, that the universe should become an orderly habitat and not be left in chaos. Over here, we have we 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 touched upon this last week. When you are in the presence of something greater than yourself, then you recognize to put aside the differences. Last week, we spoke about it in the realm of or in Sof and the idea of how the angels put aside their differences and how in our relationships we can put our side, our, 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 aside our our differences because we're tapping into something higher than ourselves. So too, the Orot and the Kalim. They come together in order because they recognize that God wants them to have this marriage. God wants them that the, the light of Atzilut should come into the vessel of Atzilut in order to then create this world. And that's why they go against their nature 
in order to come together. Now, now that we, again, now that we have maybe some sort of idea, some appreciation, when we speak about light, when we speak about vessel, and again, think about the examples we give in a relationship, in a book, in a melody, what the light uh, connotates and what the vessel. Let's bring it back and let's talk about creation, the creation of this world. Let's take a look at text five. Uh, let's take a look at text five. And you should be familiar with this text. This is the first text of the Torah. Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning of God's creation, and actually this is the accurate translation. Many times people translate it in the beginning, God created. The accurate translation is in the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and the earth. The earth was chaotic and desolate. Darkness was on the surface of the deep, and God's spirit ho hovered over the water. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, the first verse makes sense. Getting God, God's creation of heaven and the earth, we understand that. What is the whole next verse saying? The earth was desolate and chaotic. What does it mean that there was God's spirit hovered over the water? You could have just skipped that whole verse. In the beginning of God's creation of heaven and the earth. And what's the what's the third verse? We didn't have it over here. God created light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. What are we speaking about when the, this world, and it's very strange words, even in Hebrew, tohu vavohu, was desolate and chaotic. What does this mean? What is it referring to? So let there be light refers to the emanation of atzilot. It was desolate, the prior emanation before it's in. Okay, let's, 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 not, let's not get lost over there. What is What does this mean? So when we speak about that which is desolate, we are speaking about a creation of Tohu. Before we were speaking about, and the Kabbalah tells us that there was a previous form of creation before the creation of this world. In other words, it's like a surprise to some of you. This world is 2.0. Is the second, is the second, we are a perfected creation. But then before we have this world, and this is the world called of Tikkun, of fixing. Before this world that God created, God created a world called Tohu, which means a world of chaos. That's what it says, text, uh, text six. The earth was chaotic and des desolate. This refers to the breaking of the vessels. God's spirit hovered above the water. This refers to the light that the vessels Failed to observe. Now, what does that mean? What is the breaking of the vessels? We spoke about lights and vessels. What does it mean that we have the breaking of the vessels? And again, we can go very deep over here, very abstract, but in a very simple level. What does breaking of the vessels mean? What is literally, if I broke this cup, what does this mean? That the, vet, the, 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 the liquid inside cannot be contained inside the vessel. They are not compatible with one another. On a very simple level, when, at a very simple level, when light and vessel are not compatible, that breaks the vessel, and they go their separate ways. Let me give an example. I remember hearing this story a couple of years ago. So a story happened in Atlanta, and I think there's a there's a lot of depth to the story. There was a there was a huge there was a big wedding that was planned in Atlanta with uh, I think 500 guests and a very luxurious wedding. And what happens is around a day or two before the wedding, the bride and groom called it off. They broke it off literally a day or two before the wedding. Now, some may think, you know, the hall was ready. The photographer was there. The food was all there. People already flew in. Let's go to the wedding. All we're missing is the bride and groom. But everything else is there. But what? why, why is that silly? Because what is the wedding? What is the hall? What is the music? What is the photographer? What is all that in our conversation? The vessel, very good. What is the R? The bride and groom, the marriage that's taking place, that's the R. If there's no R, if the R disbands, they break up, what are you left with? Broken vessel. You're left with a wedding without the bride and groom. Well, it's the same idea. Well, well, well it's once once it once it's empty, it breaks. In other words, the idea Kab Kabbalah tells us if the light cannot go into the vessel, it breaks, and then it's empty. And then you know, then you don't have when you the R cannot go in, 
So that allows the that allows again. I think it's the same idea. It's empty. It's broken. There is no content there. There's not the mission statement is not there. So this is yes. There are vessels. Yeah. That I can imagine that upon them breaking and yep. allowing the light. Okay, say that again. A vessel breaking and allowing the light to emanate from me would be a good thing. Not necessarily letting it just go really no ill. It's for a good thing for it to be out. It will perhaps be more recognized if people would be able to see something that they might have seen before if, if it is contained in a vessel and not allowed to be in there. So I, I think what you're describing is not the way Kabbalah speaks about the breaking of a vessel. Because the breaking of a vessel, if a cup breaks, the liquid falls out and no one's able to drink from it anymore. If when we speak about the when break, the vessel breaks and the light comes up, more people can see. Okay, so we're okay. I understand that, but so that's I don't think when Kabbalah speaks about the breaking, we're talking about a negative connotation. In other words, what you're saying is that the, the, the vessel is able to amplify a very good vessel is able to amplify the light in a way that it what maybe was lacking before. But that's considered a better vessel. That's not a lack in the vessel. That's meaning again because because expressing it, that's the vessel. So you're saying. You're talking about breaking it away, expressing it even more. That's a very good vessel. That's not the breaking of a vessel. A the breaking of a vessel means that the light leaves, and now no one could appreciate it anymore. Now, let me give another. Yeah. Well, we'll get there. That's that's going to be the next one we're going to get to. How could God make a mistake? It seems yes. That's that's uh, we're we're going to get there. But let me, let me give one more example of a broken vessel. So. Today, right now, in the next uh, in the next thirty seconds, we are going to come up with a word. We're going to make up a new definition, and we are going to we are going to decide today a definition for gefilte fish feet. Gefilte, gefilte fish feet. Well, let's come up. Uh, anyone has a good word? Anyone has a good word for gefilte fish feet? Something? A any word? No, that's a real word. A, 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 a new word. A new word for gefilte fish feet. Get filter fish feet. Again, it's a made up word. It's a made up de definition. But what is a, 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 give me a word. Get feet. Okay, there we have, get feet. So for now, for the next two minutes, get feet is get filter fish feet. Now, I come to you and I say, the truth is we decided get filter fish feet don't exist. This also, this doesn't, doesn't make sense. So before, get feet referred to as get filter fish, which has feet. Now that it doesn't exist anymore. Now we're saying there is no such thing as gefilte fish feet. So what does gefit mean? Yeah. Nothing. Now gefit is, is nothing. Now you have a broken vessel. Before you had the light, which was the definition, the vessel, which was the words. Now that you're saying that those words don't hold that defi defi definition anymore, that's a broken vessel. The light left the vessel. So God said, so when God originally created this world, God created a world of tohu. But in that world, the light was too strong for the vessel. They could not come together. They could not, they did not have harmony. The light said, I want to go closer to God. The vessel said, I want to go down. What happened? They got divorced. And that happened is the breaking of the vessel. What happened was, what, what happened was that they could not come together. And this is how Kabbalah explains the second verse of the Torah. When we speak, when we say the world was desolate and chaotic, it's referring to the original world, 1.0, where God created a world, but what did it cause? Chaos. What's chaos? When you can't come together, when there's no order, when the light and the vessel could not come together. Let's take a look at uh, text. And yet. Okay. Yes. So the idea of breaking up of a plate is because we want to remember the destruction of the temple, which actually fits into what we're saying. We're talking about the breaking of the vessel that happened when, when, when we had the base of Mikdash, we had God's presence in the vessel of this world. That was the combination of the light and the vessel. There was a destruction there. 
The light left the vessel. Godliness left the temple. When we are breaking it, we're saying, although we're in a joyous time right now, we want to remember this breaking of the vessel. So that's why we break the vessel. Actually, that's a great example. The physical the physical act of breaking the vessel there represents the metaphorical idea of the light, God's energy, how it departed from this world. No, it's not, it's not that there's a bad thing. It's just saying in our time of joy, we also want to recognize that this world is not perfect. There is what to still fix in this world. Let's take a look at text 7 8. Oh, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I didn't hear you. Sorry. Yes. Because you said that Cliff 1.0. Yeah. When Cliff 1.0 destroyed by God. That, it wasn't destroyed by God. It could not come in the fusion, and therefore they broke apart. Okay. Okay. So did he rebuild the earth? Yes. 2.0. Yes. And that's this world. When we speak about God created a world, that's the second version, which we'll speak about in a moment, how over there there was a healthy marriage. But let's, we'll get there in a second. But yes, what you're saying is correct. There was a second version God created, which is a perfected world. Tikkun, the world of Tikkun, literally means the world of fixing. Because first there was a world. That, let's take a look at text, at text 7 8. The light of Tohu was intense and powerful. They intensely desired to be nullified and subsumed within their an emanating source. They had no sense of what their source wanted of them. As a result, they failed to deviate from their default nature for the sake of submitting to the greater purpose. Again, try to imagine an author, someone who's a writing, but he does not know how to put his thoughts into paper. It's too intense, his thoughts. He can never put it down on paper. That There you have the R, but cannot, the light, but cannot be in the case in the vessel. Think of someone who, a teacher, or someone, not really a teacher, but someone that has such great wisdom, but cannot think of the vessel to convey it to the student. Cannot to convey it outwards. That was this original world of Tohu, which again the light was too powerful. It causes the breaking of the uh, breaking of the light. Now we have broken vessels. We'll get to what that means. What what's the practicality of the broken vessels? And this leads us. So if we take a look at text four point a and four point five. We're not going to have time to go through all the text, but four point a. Sorry, uh, four point key term. Sorry, key term four point five is Tohu chaos, a system which divine Orot and Kalim failed to sense God's ultimate purpose. For, uh, page, yeah, 123. For which they had been emanated, resulting in the light, in the lights returning to the source. And uh, returning to the source and the vessels remaining without the light. Again, that cause, that next one, key term 4.6, the Shavira Takalim, the breaking of the vessel. When the vessels, vessel no longer lends definition to the lights, but becomes standalone entities. So all this, this, um, and the problem of all this was the light in the, in the world of Tohu. Okay, I'll do that again. You have over here the light, but the problem was the light in the world of Tohu wanted to go back to source, did not want to be defined in the Kalim, in the vessels. The light refused to become defined by spheros. Yeah, the problem, the light, and the vessel didn't want to serve the lights. So that led to broken vessels. The light slipped back to their source and the vessels ceased be being uh, receptacles. So again, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of uh, different uh, slides here. Take what will take what, what helps you, leave the rest. A broken vessel is a conduit for something. Again, you have a cup. Inside the cup is water. Now it breaks, no longer able to do so. Which leads us to the world of Tikkun. The next world, which is our world. Now, what, what happened to these broken vessels? Again, obviously re re recognizing it's not a physical existence. This is all metaphorical. We're talking about capitalistic terms. What happened to them? So what happens to these empty vessels? If you have in this world, the world of Tikkun, which again, this is the world 2.0 that Steve was saying. A second world God created. Over here, we have the healthy marriage between the or and the Kali, the light and the vessel. They come together to recognize I'm here for a higher purpose. What is this? Our godly soul. We said before, going back to the beginning of the class, our godly soul wants to recognize I need to submit myself for something higher. What God needs for me, not my nature, not what I want, what I'm needed for. 
What are the broken vessels? Again, why did they break? Because they were selfish. They didn't want to go into the vessel. They want, that's the source of the animal soul. Because a broken vessel, this, which is selfishness, leads ultimately to create a vacuum. There was a vacuum there. What did the vacuum get filled by? Animalistic desires. So here we're saying, we're showing how, what was, we said, what is the source of negativity of the animal soul? It comes from this high level of godliness, this first creation. But over there, in godliness, the light and the vessel could not come together. So they broke. The vessel came down, and now that is the source of that which is, that, the, the, uh, that which is animalistic desires. Again, if you have an attribute, if you have kindness without a compass, what could that lead to? Terrible kindness. Again, if, if a person does not have a compass of what is the proper way to channel the kindness, then what could kindness lead to? You know, being kind to terrorists. That is kindness without a compass. That is the kindness of Tohu, which does not have any submission. And that leads to negativity, to evil. This is the source of the godly soul. When you have a broken vessel, it becomes its own identity. So in order to have that, in order to be able to fix this, we have the tikkun, the world of tikkun. This is the two sides of ourselves. The two sides going back to the beginning of the class. Why do we have forces of good inside of us? Why do we have the godly soul? Why do we have sometimes we're altruistic? And then the next day, we could stab someone in the back. The next day, we could be, we could be a not good person. We could, we could just care about ourselves. Because our soul comes from the world of tohu and tikkun. There was first the creation of tohu, which over there, the light did not come together with the vessel. In other words, it broke. And that led to the vessel being a vacuum, selfishness. And then you have the, then you have the world of tikkun, which is where the light and the vessel come together for a higher purpose, for being altruistic, for being something beyond myself. So the solution of the broken vessels is tikkun, where you have the ten, the ten different attributes. A we, they are aware of God's deep wish. They recognize we have to come together, and this is now. If you think about it, in this world, this idea. You know, we speak. Uh, let's go back. To, I, said, I said we're going to speak about tikkun olam. What does tikkun olam mean? Tikkun olam. Okay, a regular person who asks them, tikkun olam means doing a mitzvah, doing doing a good deed. Now we can understand what tikkun olam means. Tikkun olam means. We have the ability to be able, these broken vessels, we to be able to fix them now, be able to now take them and bring them back into their godly source. Take these which originally come from God, but they came down into this world. Now I do a mitzvah. And I take even the animalistic part of myself and I do something good with it. Now I am fixing the broken vessel. Now I am, now I am taking that selfishness within me. And I'm saying, I am willing to now put it aside for God. I mean, again, we have our godly soul, but the point in this world is not just to use out our godly soul, but to be able to take our animal soul and be able to say, use it for God. Be able to channel it. We spoke about before. The animal soul is a lot more passionate than godly soul. You know, that's the one willing to go to the football stadium in the 10 degree weather. Could we take that passion? Again, why is it more passionate? Because it comes from the world of Tohu, which is the first world, and that world is more powerful. That's why the animal soul, you asked before, uh, Alan, doesn't seem right. Why is the animal soul more powerful? Because it comes from a higher world. It comes from the world where the light was so powerful. Tikkun, our godly soul, comes from a lower world. Again, it, it's, 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 it's uh, counterintuitive. Generally, we think of our godly soul as being higher than our animal soul. Kabbalah tells us it's the exact opposite. Our, our animal soul, our, our selfishness, comes from a higher source than our alt altruistic self. It just was, it was just mismanaged. There was a vacuum there. So when we're able, and that's why it has a stronger passion. That's why it comes to us first, just like the, God, the, the, the world of Toh came before the world of Tikkun. When we are able to take the passion in this world, in our own lives and say, let me channel this to be excited about a mitzvah, to be excited about helping out another person. What are you doing now? You can understand that's tikkun olam. That is 
fixing the world of Tohu. Taking the broken vessels which fell down and say, now I, I'm taking that, elevating it, bringing it back to its original uh, idea. And this answers, and again, we're not, we're not going to have enough time to be able to go through all the text, but this answers, Karen asked before, what does it mean? God made a mistake? How could God make a mistake? Uh, did God not know that there would be a, be a breaking of the vessels? And the answer is no. God wanted this world to be this way. God did this with intent. God wanted, what is the purpose of this world? To be able to tikkun olam. To be able to fix that which is broken. To be able to take the selfishness of this world and selfishness within us, representing Tohu, the first world, and say, God says, I want you to fix that. I don't want you to be an angel. I don't want you to just be godly, just have the tikkun where the vessels of the light come together and you're a perfect person. I want you to have the vestiges of Tohu where you're selfish. You're not going to come together. There's going to be an evil world out there. And you going and you elevating the sparks. You going, that's what I mean. we speak about elevating the sparks. You know, uh, that's a very uh, common Hasidic term. So you do a mitzvah, you elevate the sparks. What does that mean? What does it mean elevate the sparks? The sparks are the sparks of the broken vessels, which are in this world. In this, you know, you take a, a, you take a table. And now I take this table, which again is just a table. But now I take this table and I build it into a table where I learned Torah on it. So I'm taking the toe. Again, this is not, there's nothing positive about this. I'm taking and I'm now elevating it to use it for a mitzvah. That's tikkun olam. That's fixing the world 1.0, which was destroyed, but now using the methods of 2.0. Again, and that's in the world. In our own psyche, we have world 1.0 is the animal soul, selfishness, and then through using world 2.0 in our own self, which is the godly soul, now I am able to make a difference in this world. Now I'm able to make a change in this world. So Rob, it's not the, the lower, weaker, godly soul overcoming the animal soul. It's them integrating, coming together, and doing something good. Yeah, through the integration of tikkun, of bringing them together, that elevates tohu. That takes the animal soul and says, because now if you think about it, you know, we speak about animal soul and godly soul, but the truth is they're both godly souls. Just one godly soul got mismanaged, had a vacuum, and became broken, and then turned animal. But it comes from godly soul. It comes originally from God. As we're saying, everything's sourced in God. We ask, where does the animal in God? Where is the animalistic nature? That's the world of Tohu. And when we do something good, what we're doing at that point is we're bringing it together, Tohu and Tikkun, and now making that proper marriage. And I want to go back to the story of the wedding, the wedding which was called off. What do the parents do? Here's the end of the story. The, par the, the, the parents of the bride and groom, and again, they were wealthy parents, and uh, they invited, they, they called 50 homeless shelters, and they invited the homeless shelters to come eat the, eat the food. I think it's a perfect example. Over here you have, the wedding was called off. The, the or left the keli, the light left the vessel. So what do the parents do? They said we could leave it like that, or we could do tikkun olam. We could take the vessel, the light which left the vessel, and now use it for proper purpose. Bring it back to its proper purpose. Invite people that can't have otherwise. This is our mission in this world. But can't keep the music. Once, you, once you're able to use it for a proper thing, again, that's using the passion of this world. Again, the passion that people display in the college stadium by the football game, that's not bad. That just has to be harnessed for the right thing. Using the energy, the desire of the, God, of the animal soul in order to harness it for goodness. That's using Tohu, the, the more powerful one, for positivity. And that's Tikkun Olam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the guy, the person who actually made the stadium said, now I'm seeing my, works, uh, my work is being complete. Again, he said, they, they, there was one time where they finished, I had 100,000 people packing into MetLife Stadium in order to finish the whole Talmud. They, they had a whole celebration. That is using the passion of this world in order for something good. And we could all find examples in our own in our own life. You know, there's out there in the world, but let me think of something practical where I have a passion towards something. Let me channel it towards something which is altruistic. I'm not even going to say good because good that, that doesn't necessarily mean godly soul. 
something which is not about me. It's not about what's making me feel good. If you also want to feel good, that's fine. But it's not, that's not where it's sourced. It's about what needs to be done now. And if you're able to channel that passion towards that, that is taking the world of Tohu, the animalistic soul, and being the sakin, doing tikkun olam, fixing it. I'll finish up with a story. Um, there was there, there's a there's a city in Paraguay, very, very poor city. Um, I believe the city is called like Caturera. And this is a city which is literally the city is on top of a garbage heap. That's what it is. Again, it's a, a, and people here, what do they do? They go through, they sift through the garbage and try to find things. Now, there was a, uh, uh, there was a very famous, I'm forgetting his name right now, but there was a very uh, famous music um, uh, uh, orchestra that decided to, decide to bring some music to this poor city to this poor city and to, um, to be able to you know, take some children there and train them. But the problem was that they didn't have in the city enough instruments for all, the, for all the children there. So one time, one of the, you know, by the practices, a child comes and they see he had an instrument and that's how I have this instrument. He said, I went to the garbage, uh, I went to the garbage heap and I found different, you know, uh, a piece here, a piece here, I put it together and I made, I made this instrument. So they, they took the inspiration from that child and they went to the garbage heap and they went and they created many, many instruments from there. And they trained them using these instruments from the garbage heap. And they called it the Recycled Orchestra. And they went around the world playing music. And this is a beautiful story, but I think it highlights this idea. Over here, you have the broken vessels, literally the broken vessels. And they made it, they took it. And they made it now into music, beautiful music. That is taking the idea of broken vessels and bringing, being misak in the world of Tohu and bringing Tikkun into this world. And this is the idea, this is our mission in this world. So again, I understand we discussed some very deep concepts over here and abstract ideas. But we're going to take out one idea from tonight's class is we are created with that godly soul, altruistic soul, and the animal soul, that which is self-serving. Where does that come from? It comes from the fact that God created two worlds. First, God created a world which was the light couldn't come together with the vessel. It was too, it broke. They didn't want to come together. There was a certain selfishness there. That led to God creating a second world of tikkun, of fixing. And it's our job. And that's where our animal soul sourced from, from the world of Tohu, which was selfish, if you want to call it. Our job in this world is to take this world and to take the to take the vestiges of the broken vessels and channel it for the good. We're doing that. That is what tikkun olam is. That is what we're here in this world. So now when you when you hear tikkun olam, you have a deeper understanding, a deeper depth to this idea. It's about taking this kabbalistic idea of this first world of tohu and doing tikkun olam, fixing it up. And the third world is going to be my mashiach. Yeah, and that, but that's but that's actually what you're saying. What is mashiach is taking all the all the broken vessels and bringing it back to this light, bringing the marriage of the light in the vessel, taking that it's not useless anymore. Now it has that marriage. And that's, yeah, that's, that, that's the, that's the, that's really what Mashiach means. Yeah. So, but it possibly means that that first world that God created is not good. It's just not bringing some of the explanation for why this discrepancy with dinosaurs so the way Kabbalah understands it is that wasn't the physical world. That, the physical world started with the world of Tikkun. The world of Tohu was still in the world of Atzilut, but that's still a spiritual world. This is all, again, it's still metaphorical. So yeah, this is we're not talking about actual world. Uh, this was, again, in the process of creation, first there was that world. That re that's why world, I said in the first class, world we imagine an actual physical world. Probably a better translation would be a realm. There was a realm where they couldn't come together, and then God created a realm where they could come together, which ultimately led to the creation of a physical world. Okay, so let's, I'll just finish off again. To Tikkun and the souls. So again, we have To is the first soul, the first world. Tikkun is the second or a second world in our in our life. We have the God, the animal soul, which we're born with, you know, the selfish part of us. Every kid is born. That's the first. The second comes by bar bat mitzvah. You have self-centered versus mission-oriented. Tohu is about self-centered. I want to go back to my source. Tikkun is about coming together. What is my mission? We have deviation. The tohu and our animal soul is about deviating from my soul's mission, from the world's mission. And then there's loyalty. Loyalty to come together in marriage and harmony. 
broken vessels versus complete vessels. Powerful, again, the Torah was more powerful. Tikkun is less powerful. The animal, so we have, it, it is a godly force which lost touch with itself. And this soul can be restored to its original setting. Rectification, Tikkun, again, the world of Tikkun, when the body and animal soul submit to God's will, they become operational vessels. And this is uh, uh, um, this is the world of Tohu. So again, when you hear the world of Tohu, the chaotic world, the world of chaos, this is, and again, uh, this is, the 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 uh, some of the ideas, some of the concepts behind it. Again, there's so much more to study on this uh, topic, but we will. Lesson four: the world of chaos. One, there's no reason to be overly impressed or intimidated by the strong desires of the animal soul. The fact that it shouts louder does not make it more genuinely you. It's more forceful simply because of its chaotic tohu origin. 2. The performance of a mitzvah and the immersive prayer transform the animal soul into a receptacle for God's light. Additionally, we can infuse spirituality into those areas of life with the animal soul. This turns the animal soul into a vessel for a higher purpose, which is an act of of tikkun. Three, if we ignore the godly soul, we remain unfulfilled. If we grant it what it desires without limit, we remain fragmented. Only when we allow the godly soul to influence the animal soul and to infuse it with direction do we introduce harmony to our lives. Okay. All right. Thank you all for, for joining. What?